This is the sound of a garbage truck in Taipei. A subway in Seoul. 3.30 in Santiago, Auckland, Singapore, Copenhagen, Los Angeles, Sydney, London, Nairobi, Venice, Shenzhen, Kuwait City, Mumbai, and Songdo. That's in South Korea. Awfully quiet. I ended up here because I was looking for the city of tomorrow. Songdo is the largest private real estate development in history. It's a master planned and entirely state-of-the-art smart city. While Songdo doesn't look like that future, some believe it's the future we need. It's only impossible until someone does it. It's also where they shot Open Gangnam Style. Just 25 years ago, Sai would have been dancing on this. Here are some other cities built on water. There is a race to build a functioning, workable city and to replicate that model all over the world. China alone would require 500 Songdo's to sustain their growing population. So how do we get here with an entire industry racing to build smart cities from scratch? Technology is the answer, but what is the question? Good question, Carlo. Are we just building cities of the future so we can have cities of the future? Let's take a step back. When cinema was born, only 14% of the world's population lived in cities. Right now, we're at 54%. And this is where we're headed. Cities today are growing at a pace that none of us have ever understood. Now, that's a huge deal when you think about it, because the resources that built the megacities of the 20th century aren't sustainable today. We do damage to nature, and we do less damage to nature when we occupy less of it. We're not going to make our planet grow and thrive by continuing to sprawl out. They're basically saying that when density is done right, it's the best, if not the only, solution to our growing climate crisis. So is future urbanization going to be a good thing or a bad thing? If you care about people, this is the defining question of our time. The Nantucket Project asked me to explore that question, because that's what they do, explore. So I read books, talked to experts, traveled around the world, asked the internet for help, and got responses from people in all these cities. This is Lucas, we met on YouTube. They'd show me around, and when I couldn't visit in person, they'd send me footage. The best thing about cities and the internet is they connect people. So this movie's about exploring what an even more connected urban future could look like. There is a renaissance in the city, and I'm honored to be a participant in the Detroit story. That was Mayor Jerome Cavanaugh making a bid for the 1968 Olympics. 50 years later, population still in decline, Detroit went bankrupt. In 2014, we had the water shutoffs in Detroit. Thousands of homes lost water due to shutoffs. And I wanted to focus on helping resolve that. So I created an application called City Water that's going to give Detroit residents their water usage in real time. That might sound boring compared to a drone delivering your pizza, but let's remember that cities only reached their full potential when they became healthier places to live. At the start of the 20th century, America's cities were spending as much on water as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. We've come a long way to an exciting era. This is Abbas. He saw my video announcing the project and wanted to make sure his city made the cut. I was born here, and I'm really passionate about bringing the city back to the point it was we're no Silicon Valley, but we're trying to become a city that brings tools and brings solutions and brings jobs back. Detroit is his company's first client. That means they're using data to prevent this kind of thing. When the citizens say, I don't need to have a smart city, but whatever new innovation it comes, if it helps me, I'm going to embrace it. And it's really encouraging just the fact that the city is willing to do a project like this. And we're hoping to launch that in January of 2017 and take that to other cities across the country. Because cities inherently just don't compete with each other, there's a huge opportunity to collaborate with other cities. We could take the best practices in sustainable urbanization and spread them around the world as quickly as possible. That is the promise of the 21st century of urbanization. It's easy to imagine adopting a Bess's app in Santiago. And Los Angeles is a city that's never taken water for granted. Well, what can we do? The rest of the city needs drinking water. Water again. We use water from 1,400 miles away that is transported long distances using over 19% of our entire energy budget for the state of California. David uses solar power to turn air into clean water, which he gives away for free to a city or sometimes turns into food. Awesome. Every building, ideally, can make its own water and be water self-reliant. In the same way future cities won't need telephone lines, maybe they also won't need water pipes. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. 
be water, my friend. Like that, you see? Oh, I see. I get the idea. When people are innovating and developing solutions to address our most fundamental needs, a city will thrive. What kind of cities do we want? How do we want to interact as people in cities? Because cities aren't buildings, they're people. Part of the job of urban success means to attract and produce skilled people and to retain skilled talent. This goes together in a city. Opportunity and solving problems as they arise, innovating. Detroit is innovating right now, probably kind of like the way it was in the 1890s, when over 100 companies were working furiously to figure out the automobile. That's also like Silicon Valley in the 60s and 70s, Bangalore in the 80s, and Shenzhen, where 90% of the world's drones are manufactured right now. There's at least 26% of the technology from Silicon Valley actually come from Shenzhen. Cities are more complicated than the headlines they make on the other side of the world. There's no YouTube in Shenzhen, so nobody saw my video there. Fortunately, George goes to school in Hong Kong where he saw the movie and emailed me. Then he filmed Shenzhen when he went home on the weekend. Thanks, George. Like Songdo, Shenzhen was not a city 25 years ago. And like many other cities, they built giant American-style highways. Currently, the U.S. has policies that we're using general tax revenues to fund highways. We're basically subsidizing people to drive. And that's why it's cheaper to drive to the grocery store to buy blueberries from 4,000 miles away than it is to walk over to the farmer's market and buy local. Can you tell I'm eating blueberries? You can tell you're eating what you got. Okay, cool. Our subsidies and policies encourage bad habits, but the false message we send globally is that big highways solve problems. Transportation's been a very sleepy field for 50 years. You're starting to see people rethink what our streets are about and who they're for. Now cities are spending money getting rid of highways, confirming that more transportation choices and less parking are often the best ways to fight traffic and congestion. This used to be a motorway, now it's a public space. So you got green space, shade, clean water, natural cooler temperature in the area, and sure enough, traffic got better. Seoul is turning another highway into a path for people. Paris is going full pedestrian along the Seine. In Singapore, where they just debuted a self-driving taxi, they're also building a city with no cars. Same thing in Mannheim, Germany. Which, ironically, is where this guy invented the first car. The future of our cities is about people. That really does mean focusing on public transportation and providing choices for how people get around. The number one factor that determines uh, whether someone can escape poverty, you would think it'd be like crime rates or school, it's commute time. When walking, cycling, and public transportation are the fastest ways to move, nobody feels like a second-class citizen for not owning a car. That's gonna be the secret sauce for cities in the 21st century. Check out all these Metro cards. That last one's from Singapore, where I didn't meet a single person who owns a car. It's hard to beat the Singaporeans. In Singapore, a Toyota Corolla costs 140 grand, and the government only lets you lease it for 10 years. The fact that they embrace having something that actually charges people for the social cost of their driving is a policy that basically all crowded cities should be embracing. In Santiago, you can get around in this electric rickshaw for free. The design came from China. Let's go back there. I actually never went to Shenzhen. Nice meeting you over the internet. George and Nina shot the interview and I tuned in on Skype. Remember those giant American-style highways? That's what Shenzhen had in mind when they hired Vicky. You know, we proposed to them a very different idea. Instead of increasing the highway, we reduce it. And then uh, we prepared for a city where people can actually uh, use more high-speed self-driving car. People can actually use drones to deliver daily grocery. Hiding cars in tunnels points towards a city made for people. Maybe we could try this in Los Angeles. Considering how quickly China went from this to that, and from that to this, it's not surprising this project is happening in Shenzhen. The excitement of a happening place which attracts people, you have to have a degree of openness and not too much regulation. Shenzhen spends more time making things than hiring patent lawyers to protect them. In the West, it's called theft. Out here, it's called sharing. And if you want to know more about that, you should watch my friend Jim's documentary. The point is, it's exciting to live in a city where people are making things. That's why I moved to New York, because I was drawn to all these people who were doing more with less. The most elusive solutions often spring from unlikely places. Geothermal energy power plant. This is a fog catcher, and it can get up to 500 liters of water a day. If you can do something good with low budget resources, you can scale up very rapidly. 
Sometimes those solutions can end up shaping a city's identity. In Lagos, which is where this music is from, by the way, they call it kanji. The word literally means like hustling. Trying to reimagine these challenges in Africa as opportunities to innovate is the spirit of kanji. Flooding is an issue in Makoko, so they built a school that floats by using cheap and available materials. This woman turns discarded plastic into bricks in Karachi. In Nairobi, nobody uses credit cards or cash. All you need is a phone. In Manila, they turn water bottles into solar light bulbs. And the people of India have always made more out of less. The inexpensive clay fridge that requires no electricity or their hyper-efficient, massive homemade meal delivery system could never have been conceived by some well-heeled think tank. Dr. Jockham has lived in the slums for 50 years, built a million houses and toilets, been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, and brought his organization, Slum Dwellers International, to 43 different countries. We don't need you to come and sit on my head and dance. I know how to write my song. It is my dance, my song, I will play it. He's basically saying, we got this. If you want to help, channel your support through us. For example, here's a self-run recycling operation in Jockham's neighborhood. We all want to be involved in the futures of the places where we live. You go and see every city in the world. All has been planned by very, very super well-known, renowned architect and philosopher and so on and so forth. You have lost all the sense of hearing from the people. Unfortunately, a lot of architects have a sort of a pre-designed approach that they force into whatever context and culture they get to. And not every city can be like Singapore, where 80% of the people live in public housing. So that means you don't have slums, nor do you leave the city and its residents in the hands of the private rental sector. Back to Mumbai. We tend to disregard places like Deravi, where Dr. Jockham lives, but it's a rare example of a neighborhood solving its own housing needs. My friend Matthias works to draw attention to what's actually working in neighborhoods before attempting to intervene. He compares Mumbai to post-war Tokyo. American planners started to focus on infrastructure development. Everything else was left to people themselves. And that created the gradual growth of a neighborhood. Like Tokyo in the 1950s, it's your neighbors planning and building your home in Derivate. Up to 90 people can be working on a small site for four weeks and produce a house on much better quality than the affordable housing that the government is developing. And embodying the kind of incremental growth private developers rarely aim for. The places that are self-built, we often see an incredible amount of care, feeling of ownership, a human scale in terms of what is actually being built. How do we combine the genius that's really there in the streets that's solving its own problem? How do we then bring in a little bit of outside technology or better public management in order to upgrade them and to empower their citizens' lives more effectively? Post-war Tokyo, unlike Mumbai, had major funding and state-of-the-art infrastructure. And 30 years later, it was the city of the future. That's not my kind of place. Go someplace else. I don't think so, Mr. Duggard. Around the same time that Tokyo was booming, Copenhagen was struggling. In the 70s, we had a couple of energy crises. People started to fight for getting better bicycle infrastructure, and the city gradually started developing that mobility system. In many ways, it is Copenhageners who have wanted to get their city back. Denmark's capital insists on citizen-driven change. I think part of Copenhagen's success is that they've had a very incremental approach to the urban development. Instead of having this giant master plan, they've tested and tried out different solutions. Low rise, mixed use neighborhoods, great public space, clean water. This new power plant turns waste into clean energy. And it's a ski slope. We don't think ourselves only as designers and architects. We think about ourselves also as social scientists. The best part is they still think they can do better. We have very far to go in actually creating an urban environment where cars are the last choice for the ordinary citizen. If you buy a car in Denmark, you pay 150% tax. It doesn't matter if it's electric. Destination, please. I'm super excited about self-driving cars, but without good planning and policy, we might just end up being more comfortable sitting in traffic jams. For a collection of microprocessors, you're awfully touching. Of course, it's possible to make any city around the world a good bicycle city. And the more we get public transit, the more room there'll be for one of the very best kinds, bicycles. You could start with getting more people mobilized on foot and on bicycle, and it's so cheap to be 
sweet to people than it is to actually having to support these heavy transport systems. A person on a bike puts 1 65th, puts 1 65 thousandth, 65 thousandth. A person on a bike puts a fraction of the wear and tear that the average car puts on the road. And as you'll remember, roads don't pay for themselves. Since I started editing this project, New York City Bike has broken daily ridership records six times. And the cool part is you can see all the data gathered from the program in real time. In the past, our streets have really been governed by anecdotes instead of analysis. And so we brought very focused, data-driven approaches to analyze the impacts of our projects. And so really seeing how we can take technology and not kind of replace what we're able to do, but kind of enhance our ability to interact with our environment. Well, then what do you want to do? I don't know, something. Wow. Some think that technology is going to make us more physically isolated. People will stop moving around. Right. They, they just won't need to. You basically connect your brain to the internet and you turn off your senses and the senses come from the internet. And so you can feel this exact setting. Why would you get in a car? Why would you get on a plane? I just couldn't imagine that. And the whole point of this video was to go to real places and connect with real people, mostly in person. I also made this video with these people and for these people. It's kind of like a city. Thinking hard about who we're making them for and who we're changing them with is always a good starting point. Super, super tired. <laughs> okay, I'm exhausted. I'm sure you're exhausted. And I barely scratched the surface, but uh, that's what I got. Bye-bye, Copenhageners. Bye, Singaporeans. Bye, Songdonians. Bye, Mumbaiikers. I'm gonna leave you with this quote from the great Jane Jacobs. Lowly, unpurposeful, and random as they may appear, sidewalk contacts are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life may grow. Cities remind us how much we benefit from and actually desire to share physical space with other people. But that doesn't mean one city can't learn from another. And the speed at which we're sharing what we're learning, the speed at which I connected with an army of filmmakers all over the world to make this video, was the most encouraging part of the experience. And while every city was exciting, it was the people in every city that made me optimistic for the future.